Welcome to Authors and Wine at Google. Uh, we welcome today Randall Graham. Um, just completing a short intro, and then Randall will join us here up front. And thanks to everyone for coming. Randall's fascination with wine began in Southern California when he stumbled upon a wine shop close to his parents' house in around when he was 20 years old. They asked him if he wanted to open a charge account, and he enthusiastically replied yes. He realized early on that to be able to experience the kinds of, the kinds of wines he had there all the time, he'd have to learn how to make them himself. Sometime later, he found himself working at the wine merchant in Beverly Hills, sweeping floors. Through exceptionally good karma, he was given the opportunity to taste a large number of really good French wines. And this experience turned him into a wine fanatic. He's well known as one of the pioneers of Rhone varietals in California, and he's found success with obscure Italian varietals as well. In 1989, he was indicted into the who's who of cooking in America by Cook's Magazine for lifetime achievement and leadership in the improvement and development of American cuisine. He was also awarded the honor of Wine and Spirits Professional of the Year by the James Beard Foundation in 1994. The 2010 Dubof Wine Book of the Year, Been Doing So Long, is a collection of Randall's writings from the Bonnie Dune newsletter as well as articles, speeches, and essays. It's described as a truly original approach to the subject of wine, one that's full of wit, intelligence, and mischief. He takes us through his journey of marketing and crafting wine. He writes with passion about wanting to make honest wines, wines that represent the places that they come from. He embraces the wabi-sabi approach to organic winemaking as an essential element of the beauty of the natural wine. He believes that it's through these flaws that wines become revelatory and capable of directing our attention to new places and ideas. Soon we'll get a taste of this vision as Bonnie Dune releases its first biodynamic wines in two to three years. Please join me in welcoming Randall Graham. Typically, oops. typically, I begin these seances with an um, invocation from Alice Cooper, uh, welcome to my nightmare. And uh, I thought I would give you sort of the Reader's Digest condensed version of the, or the brief history of Bonnie Dune, and then kind of take you up to the present time. Uh, I started Bonnie Dune in 1981, uh, basically with the quixotic notion that I was going to make the great American Pinot Noir. This was my obsession, my ide fixe, my mantra. And I suppose, fortunately for me, it didn't quite work out as according to plan. It was about three orders of magnitude more complicated than I ever imagined it would be. So I luckily made the acquaintance of the Albanian wine merchant, Kermit Lynch, uh, when he was a wine merchant in Albany, California. And uh, Kermit uh, got me interested in Rhone varieties. And uh, I had a very simplistic hypothesis, which was it's warm and dry in southern France. It's warm and dry in uh, the central coast of California. Maybe the Rhone varieties would do well in California. What, a, what an interesting idea. And truly, I mean, we sort of think of Rhone varieties as being sort of mainstream. But remember, 30 years ago, they didn't really exist. There were three Syrah vineyards in California, all of them uniformly dreadful in their own unique way. Um, there was Mourved, but nobody knew Mourved was, was here because it was traveling under a, an alias of Mataro. And that was thanks to Daryl Cordy in Sacramento who, who clued me in on that. And no one, apart from David Bruce, knew that Grenache could actually make red wine. Um, because all the Grenache that we experienced was fairly dreadful, drecky, pink wine that was quite sweet and quite horrible. But David had actually made some amazingly, well, he actually made one good one and one bad one in 1970 and 1971 of uh, Grenache. And uh, this was in 1984. I was thinking, you know, this Pinot Noir thing is really not working out quite as, as well as I had hoped. I need a plan B if I'm going to stay in the wine business. 
having gone to Davis, and you know, this is kind of what I decided to do. I'm, I'm going to figure out how to make this work. So I needed a plan B. So the plan B was let's try Rhone varieties, and maybe let's try a blend. Maybe if we blended Grenache, Syrah, and Mourvedre together, we could do something that kind of vaguely approximated a Chateauneuf du Pape. And uh, that's how Cigar Volant was conceived. And looking back in retrospect, I have to say that it's miraculous that the wine came out as well as it did. There are a million ways to go wrong. There's many infinite number of ways to go wrong. And the fact that I didn't go terribly wrong um, too often of the time is, is kind of a miracle in retrospect. Oddly enough, uh, last year, Bonnie Dune, uh, Bonnie Dune has been this kind of funny journey for me. And uh, last year and last year or two have been kind of a recapitulation and kind of reevaluation of where I've been and just kind of a pause and kind of where, where is Bonnie Dune going in the next phase. So what's interesting is we actually staged two vertical tastings of Cigar Volant. 25 vintages of Cigar Volant. We did one in um, New York at Terroir, uh, I'm sorry, at uh, Hearth Restaurant in the village, and we did another one at Manresa Restaurant in, in, uh, in Los Cados. And um, luckily, we had some large format bottles, and these were, in many cases, the last large format bottle in existence. In some cases, they were the last any lot bottle in existence. So we had all the vintages, many of them in large format bottles. And I'll tell you, this, is, this was kind of the freakiest thing that happened at the tasting. Many things would happen. It was, these, these tastings were extravagant. I mean, we had like literally 1,200 glasses that were used in this, that were harmed in this uh, <laughs> exercise. Of all the wines we tasted, many of them were very good. Many of them, some of them were not so good, but they were all pretty much alive. Pretty much every single one of them was alive. Uh, of all the wines we tasted, the first two vintages, the 1984 and the 1985, were arguably the most interesting wines of the evening. Not necessarily the best, but the most interesting. And so it really, they really gave me a, a lot of pause to reflect. In other words, what the heck have I been doing for 30 years, <laughs> such that the first two wines that I made, knowing absolutely nothing, were the two most interesting wines of the evening. And it did make me think that maybe in the earliest days, when maybe aware of a couple of, there a couple of possible conclusions of, of this, or deductions from this. One is that logic and ratiocination really doesn't, you know, is far cracked up, more cracked up than it, than it should be. You know, in other words, thinking things out generally doesn't always work. Sometimes you just go on your instinct and that's a, that's a better way. And certainly in the early days, I was operating on my instinct more than any real insight. Nobody knew anything about uh, making these, these varieties. Nobody knew, for example, that Syrah was a cool climate grape, that Syrah actually had different requirements than Mourvedre and different requirements than Grenache. The only thing I knew about winemaking was what I had read in a book, which was, if you want to make a faux Chateauneuf du Pape, or if you want to make something that tastes like a Chateauneuf du Pape, it needs to have a lot of Grenache in it. Okay, a lot of Grenache in it, check. Uh, needs to go in a large vessel, okay, oops, large vessel, check. Keep it away from oxygen, okay, keep it away from oxygen, check. And that's what we did, and it worked. So. Bonnie Dune has been on this kind of funny path for the last 30 years, and it's, the way I characterize it is essentially it's been an adventure in unbridled viticultural id, and enological id for that matter too. So in other words, it's been experimentation, it's been messing around, it's been having fun, it's been trying every possible permutation and combination of grape variety, that one possibly could, every winemaking style, and having fun and making people happy. It's made a lot of people happy. The only person it didn't really make happy was me, unfortunately, at least uh, in the last several years. Bonnie Dune got very complex, very labyrinthine, almost Borgesian in complexity. 
um, labyrinth, <laughs> labyrinthine, as it were. So uh, all along the way, I had, had always and am always, have always been a lover of European wines. And I love European wines for their uniqueness, their specificity. They're sort of about something this mysterious other element. And what is this mysterious other element? This mysterious other element is terroir. It's a sense of place. It's this idea that a wine can be not just about the grape, but somehow also capture a quality of a place. And it's not even just the place, but it's also the, the culture of the place, the history of the place, many, many different aspects. And this is what makes your great European wine great. And this is what arguably makes New World wines, relatively speaking, somewhat banal. So I've been giving talks and writing articles about terroir and how beautiful it is and how precious it is and how truly it's, it's really the most precious thing that exists in the wine business. And then sort of looking at myself in the mirror and observing to my chagrin, there was nothing at all congruent in what I was saying with what I was doing, not a single thing. There was no, I was producing zero vin de terroir. Not only was I not producing any vin de terroir, there were no imminent prospects for producing vin de terroir. So it was time, this was kind of my existential moment. I had recently turned 50, I had a child, and um, I had a serious medical uh, problem. So this was kind of my, my intimation of mortality. And the thought was, okay, now what are you going to do when you grow up? It's time to kind of settle down, buckle down, and try to, try to do something with your life, Randall, for God's sakes. So the first thing I thought is, you know, Bonnie Dune is just way too complex, too many moving parts. We were producing in the height, in the heyday, um, about 450,000 cases annually, which made us the 28th largest winery in the United States. And this was actually me meant that we had to compete with people who actually knew what they were doing, who actually really were in the wine business and you know, could do all these things. So we accidentally became a large winery. And we're very leveraged and very, um, you know, all the things that are really dangerous about being in business. So the first thought was, I gotta sell Bonnie Dune. I just have to do it because the problem was, of course, nobody wanted to buy Bonnie Dune uh, for more than like six cents. So I ended up selling off those assets that were semi-detachable. And it turns out, in fact, that these were the assets that I, were, I was least attached to. So I sold off our large brands. I sold off Big House and Cardinal Zinn, shrunk the production, simplified the production, and then started focusing in on the idea of finding a place where I could grow grapes and possibly do something in a true vin de terroir. So a couple of years go by. It turns out that it's really hard to rebrand yourself um, when people think you are this kind of goofy, happy-go-lucky, you know, anything for a joke kind of winery with funny labels and this sort of you know, whatever insouciant attitude that you have, allegedly insouciant attitude, it's hard to get people to take the wine seriously. So it it's, has been a, a bit of a struggle. And uh, we've continued to shrink the production. And then last year, I sold off this other brand we had, which was called Pacific Rim. And that was a winer we had spun off in Washington. And all along the way, I've been saying, like, how can I get escape velocity and do this next thing. So I'd been looking at a lot of property and uh, go, going on a lot of realtor dates, if you will. And one property is nice and another property is nice. And you know, I never really was all that excited about any of them until this one property I came to. I actually turned out that I had dreamt about this property. And when I saw it, I thought, hmm. I remember this property. This is quite amazing. And uh, sure enough, this was the property. And it's in, it's in San Juan Batista. And I ended up buying it. It gets even stranger, because I also dreamt about a mountain lion on this property. And I saw the mountain lion recently, which was also quite interesting. And 
Luckily for me, it was quite far away, but my colleague, Philippe, got to see it at very close range, and that was a little more challenging for him, about 20 feet away, so that scared the heck out of him. Anyway, so now I've got the property. Now what do I do? And um, so the express in intention is how do you make a van de terroir? And the problem is how do you do it essentially in a short lifetime or what is left of one's lifetime? There's basically two ways of doing it, I think. Well, there's the European way, which is to, to iterate and observe over 500 to 800 years. This is not a practical way. It's okay if you, you know, if you can consistently reincarnate, reincarnate yourself, you know, pretty with, with some degree of precision, it works. But uh, failing that, less, less well. So essentially, I think there's only two ways to approach it. One is decide you love X grape. You are just crazy about X grape. And then figure out how are you going to make your X grape somewhere. In other words, how can you find conditions that you know or believe will be brilliant for this grape? Pinot Noir is a good example. And you've got a lot of people running around who are obsessed with Pinot Noir. Most of them are men. Why? Because it's really, really difficult. And if you're a guy, you are just genetically predisposed to do things that are like pretty much impossible because that's how you know that you're, you're a real guy. So you're, you've got all these people out chasing this holy grail. And the problem with this, I believe, is that at the end of the day, at the end of the day, the very best thing you can do is produce something that tastes vaguely Burgundian, that will never be as interesting as proper Burgundy. However, it will be like 10 times as expensive as proper Burgundy because the effort that you have to put into replicating these conditions is so wildly expensive. And at the end of the day, I'm not sold that you're really going to come up with anything all that original. So that's one way of doing it. The other way of doing it, I believe, maybe there's other ways, but I haven't thought of them. The other way is find a piece of property that you imagine, rightly or wrongly, possesses the possibility of expressing terroir. Now, it's a little bit tautological. What is terroir? Terroir is a sense of place. Okay, well, every place then expresses a sense of place. By definition, not all places are as interesting or as expressive or as eloquent as others. Some don't have a lot. It's like people. Some people just don't have a lot to say. Some people have a lot to say. Terroir, some terroirs have a lot to say. Those are the ones that are interesting. Terroir is essentially the ability of a site and a plant to solve each other's problems. So in other words, a brilliant terroir is one that solves the problems more elegantly most than the other surrounding areas most of the time, such that it's able to impart a distinctiveness to that, to that wine. And in Europe, it's quite, it's quite extraordinary, where literally the different terroir or the different cru or vineyards are separated sometimes by 30 feet or 40 feet, and they will be very different one from the other. So this is really, really extraordinary. So how can you, how can you get at this? How can you illuminate this in a short, short period of time? So many of these decisions seem utterly arbitrary. What kind of rootstock do you grow? What kind of variety do you grow? What kind of spacing do you grow? What sort of row orientation do you grow? Do you, do you plant them on? Um, how do you trellis them? Um, do you irrigate? Do you not irrigate? OK, so I've had this idea uh, that there are certain things that need to be observed. So let me get back to, the, uh, to what I think is really the gist of terroir, or the gist of, uh, the gist of a great wine. The gist of a great wine is, I believe, a grape variety or a blend of grape varieties that somehow 
have a perfect congruency to the site on which they're grown. So in other words, Pinot Noir is a brilliant grape, but it's not a brilliant grape when you grow it in Fresno. It's a ridiculous grape when you grow it in Fresno, but when you grow it in, in Maurice Saint Denis or Vendromonet or Chambertin, it's totally brilliant. Uh, Nebbiolo is a brilliant grape when you grow it in Barolo, not very many other places. Cabernet is a pretty good grape when you grow it in, in, in uh, Napa Valley, but it's a brilliant, it's a, an extraordinary grape when you grow it in the Medoc. So my belief is that there's not necessarily, there, there are some grapes that are more interesting than others, that's for sure. And there's some grapes that are not very interesting at all. But essentially, what is interesting about a grape is how well suited it is to the place where it's grown. So the real question is how do you find that congruency between the grape and the place that it's grown? So here's how I, I've broken down the problem. First problem is I decided if you want to grow a grape that expresses terroir, you need to amplify the signal. And it's basically kind of a, a physics or, or electronics problem. What you want to do is amplify the signal without distorting it. So it's signal to noise ratio. So how do you boost the signal without distorting it, creating noise? One of the ways is not irrigate. In other words, if you have grapevines that are exploring a large volume of soil territory, they're imprinting on more of the qualities of the site and expressing it and distilling it, if you will, into the wine that's, that's expressed. Um, you want to have probably limited um, production. So in other words, again, this kind of concentration effect. Lots of roots, very little fruit. It's kind of, again, concentrating the signal. Um, you don't want to deform the wine in, in the winery. You don't want to use a lot of new oak. You don't want to pick it over ripe. You don't want to use cultured yeast. You don't want to use high-tech methods of reverse osmosis. All those things essentially deform the intrinsic character of the wine. So I came to this like, OK, I need, to dry, I need to dry farm. I need to grow grapes without irrigation. I've got this land. It's got really interesting soil. But you know, it only rains about 16 inches a year in San Juan Batista. And a good year, it might be 20. But most of the time, it's like 15 or 16, which is pretty marginal. Some of our soils are nice and deep which hold, and hold a lot of moisture. Others are kind of sandy, not so deep, not a lot of moisture. I ran into a friend of mine a couple of years ago at a barbecue who follows these things. And I said, you know, Greg, do you have any ideas about, you know, what can I do to really, I want to dry farm. Are there any like really clever techniques that you know of to um, enhance the water holding capacity of the soil? He says, you know, I've, I've been reading about this stuff. There, it's, there's these things in South America. There's this stuff called biochar. And you may want to just check it out. There's, I don't really know very much about it, but there are a couple of people who are really interested in it. It seems like it has a lot of potential. So I kind of filed this away, and a year goes by. And then I finally got the property and we're ready to do something with it. And I remembered, and I started doing some research on biochar. And it turns out that biochar not only is the answer for producing grapes in a dry climate. It's probably the answer for enhancing the terroir of your site. And it's probably also the answer for saving the planet. So here's the deal with biochar. I go to see the biochar maven, whose name is Hans-Peter Schmidt. He's in, he's in Bern, uh, Switzerland. He's manufacturing biochar. However, so this is what biochar do does. Biochar is essentially charcoal that is derived from biomass that, that is heated in the absence of oxygen. And you get this kind of crumbly uh, charcoal material. You mix it with very high quality compost, roughly 50-50. You incorporate it into the soil. And it enhances the water holding capacity of the soil by about 30%, which is coincidentally exactly the amount that I've calculated I need to increase mine by to dry farm. 
But more interestingly than that, the biochar, the, the molecular structure, the chemical structure, the physical structure, has a lot of micropores. And this creates, uh, and also really interesting, uh, I think, carboxyl groups at the ends of the, ends of the molecules. And this essentially is like crack cocaine for beneficial soil microbes, for mycorrhizae. So it, it provides a habitat for them to live and a, and a um, nutritional source for them to live. So the mycorrhizal population goes completely out of, out of control. And this is what brings minerals into the plant. This is what nourishes the plant, keeps it healthy, keeps it vital. And, um, amplifies terroir. So if you're growing produce, if you're growing root vegetables, um, the vitamin content, the mineral content, the sugar content of all these things just goes up enormously. We're going to do, I think this afternoon, a comparative potato tasting of this is, these are your potatoes on biochar, here's your potatoes normale. And I've never done this before, I have no idea how it's going to come out. They're probably going to taste exactly alike, <laughs> but we'll, we will find out. We'll be the first ones in Mountain View, California, to ever experience biocharred potatoes. Okay, so then it turns out, um, so Peter is making this biochar and having really amazing results. However, it turns out that what, that only represents a small part of what he's doing, and, the, and it's not even the most interesting thing that he's doing. The most interesting thing that he's doing is he's turning his vineyards into gardens. And he's developed a set of rules for formalizing how do you turn essentially a farm or how do you turn a monoculture into a polyculture into, a, into something that resembles a state of nature, a balanced uh, ecosystem. So his vineyards don't look like vineyards. They look like gardens. You've, you've got a row of grapes and then interplanted you've got a row of apple trees, a row of pears and olives and peche de vigne and rose bushes and flowering rosemary and sage and lavender and this and that and bee hotels, which he calls them. And you get an immense amount of biodiversity in these, in these fields and therefore you can produce grapes with minimal intervention. Switzerland, it rains a lot. It's very humid, so they have to do something. But in California, I'm convinced we can pretty much create an Edenic situation with, with no need to, to do any kind of sprays whatsoever. So this is very, very interesting. Okay, so a couple of, couple of problems solved. The fun, how are we doing on time, by the way? Are we sort of okay? Okay, great. Um, it still sort of begs the question, what the heck do you grow? And how do you develop a methodology for, for, for figuring that out? It came to me, I'm not sure exactly how it came to me, but it, it came to me. And, and it came, you know, nothing ever comes in one flash, it comes in sort of multiple flashes, I guess like sunsets or LSD or something. But I was having dinner at Oliveto restaurant not too, not too many months ago. And um, the owner, he says, well, can I pour you something? I said, great, pour me something wacky, something interesting, fun, tasty, whatever you think is, I should have, pour, pour me a glass. He pours me a glass of this stuff, totally great, amazing, mineral, complex, fabulous wine. He says, what do you think it is? I said, I don't know. It's, it may t reminds me a little bit about the, of the wines of Mount Etna the uh, Nerolo Mascalese from Mount Etna. He said, very good guess, Randall, but no, it's not Mount Etna, but very good guess. I said, well, what the heck is it? He said, brings out the bottle. It turns out it's a wine from the Canary Islands, from Lanzarote, and the grape is called Listan Negro. I said, this wine is fantastic. He, says, hey, let me show, he says, let me show you a picture of these vineyards. Goes out in the back prints off a page from the website, and uh, he shows me a picture of the vineyards, and this looks like the moon. If the moon had vineyards with palm trees on it, that's what these vineyards would look like. The, vineyards are, the vines are planted inside of craters, and around the craters are little volcanic rocks, um, basalt rocks, that shelter the craters, because it's very windy, it's very dry, <coughs> And uh, they need to capture every molecule of moisture that lands anywhere in the vicinity and 
shelter the vines from the wind. So well, this, this knocks me out, you know, so these, this has to be like the most extreme place on the planet where grapes are grown. Hot, windy, miserable, terrible. So the next, maybe the next day or two days later, I'm having dinner with um, the wine critic from the Chronicle, uh, John Bonet, and I say, John, I had like the most amazing wine the other night, this freaky wine from Lanzarote called Lista Negro, and he starts laughing. I said, John, you know, what's so funny? It's he says, do you have any idea what Listan Negro is? I said, it's Listan Negro. He said, there's a synonym for Listan Negro. I said, what the heck is it? You'll, you'll never guess what it is. Okay, I give up. What is it? It turns out Listan Negro is synonymous with what is called the Mission Grape. The Mission Grape is the first grape that came to California with the Spanish missionaries. My vineyard is on Mission Vineyard Drive, as it turns out. But here's the kicker. The Mission Grape is arguably the worst vinifera grape that has ever been invented, ever been discovered, ever been observed. It has no redeeming qualities. It has no color, no flavor, no acid, nothing. It's horrible. It's totally horrible. However, under these conditions, it produces completely brilliant wine. Go figure. What does this mean? What does this mean? I think it means, again, there's no such thing as most brilliant. There is best suited. And I think also it means that if you have a terroir that is strong enough, and I, and I certainly believe that the terroir on Lanzarote is about as strong as it gets, if the terroir is strong enough, the variety itself or, or blend of varieties really kind of pales in significance and it really essentially becomes a carrier. It's just simply a carrier. It's really not something that you just want to get the balance more or less right. You want it to have the right amount of acidity and the right amount of sugar. But apart from that, it's just there to bring this other character along. So it's really, a, in a sense, a, a question of gestalt. So instead of focusing on, on one foreground, you kind of flip-flop it. So the variety is really in the background and the terroir is in the foreground. So how can you do that? So I think, I think I may have found a way to do it. You grow the grapes from seeds rather than from cuttings. And um, why might this work? For a couple of reasons. It, could, it might not work. I mean, this could be like, I've talked to people who know about these things. Roughly, it's half and half. Half of the people say, Randall, you are, this is like going to be the most expensive waste of time ever. And the other people say, you know what? It's some, some variant of, this is so crazy, it just might work. Or something like that. Here's why I think it, it might work. One, seeds behave very different than cuttings. Gra grapes, wh whatever, whatever plant you're growing, whether it's a tree or a vine, when you grow a grape from a seed, you have what is called geotropism. So the, the the roots go straight down to China. Whereas if you grow grapes from a, from a cutting, they move laterally. So certainly there's going to be more of this desire to find water at all costs from a seedling. The second thing that I think is quite interesting is instead of having a single variety or, or two or three clones or th two or three varieties, you have essentially a true population where every vine is genetically distinctive from every other vine. Theoretically, they're all in the same family, they're all from the same clan, but it's sort of, I'm imagining, the difference between uh, an orchestra, a full orchestra, and a chamber group. Chamber group is lovely, but it's small. An orchestra has a depth, a complexity, a richness of sound that you can't replicate any other way. So I'm, I'm thinking that with this tremendous diversity, something is going to happen. Now bear in mind, what I'm trying to achieve is not identify the best grape. Maybe I might accidentally find the best grape or find the best grapes or certain class of grapes that seem to be well suited to the site. But really wh what I'm most interested in is what happens to a population? What can you achieve with a population? 
And maybe within that population, are there criteria for inclusion or exclusion, that you, some rules that you might want to enforce in, in generation two when you decide, okay, the grapes that are like the wrong color, okay, we'll put them over here, we'll make another wine out of them, or the grapes that ripen too early, we're gonna put them over here. But I think at the very least, you're bringing something unique into the world. At the very least, you're bringing 10,000 new, new varieties that didn't exist any, uh, previously. So I, I think it's, it's a good bet. And um, whether the wine's any good or not, I think it's going to be distinctive. I think it's going to be amazing. As we often say at Bonnie Dune, what, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> so I think that's pretty much the, um, the state of the dune. Uh, right now, um, I could read a sec section from the book, or I can entertain questions, or both. Okay. Questions first or book first? Sure, of course. You got to have some questions. Yeah. Uh, I noticed you're using, you're, you're, you're speaking to this crowd and you use terms like noise. How do you, how do you come by knowledge of such terms having been in languages? Oh, if you stay in school long enough, as I did, you, you learn all kinds of weird <laughs> stuff. If, if you've majored in six things, you, you know. When you, when you go to Santa Cruz, you, you can never actually graduate in four years. It's a, it's a it's known impossibility. Um, so if you stay in school long enough, you, you learn all these goofy things. Yeah? So in a lot of the um, vineyards of old, people would make field blend. Yes. Which is sort of akin to your notion of like, Correct. scratch, you sort of get what you get. Right. I don't know if those fields are clones of each, you know, a lot of the vines are clones of each other, but you know, how do you compare this with a field, like just a field blend? So the question is, how do I compare this project to a field blend? Essentially, it is a field blend kind of on, on steroids, um, if you will. I mean, the, the mostly Italians, some Portuguese who, who did the original field blends, you know, I think they did this by intuition. You know, you 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 get a sense. It's like when you, when you're making a dish. You, you know, you want some elements. You you know you you know th this needs. I need color from here. I need acid from here. I need body from here. And when you grow grapes in a, in a warm climate, in a Mediterranean climate, every Mediterranean climate has come to the same conclusion that you need disparate elements. You need several elements to produce a wine that's balanced and complex. And a field blend is really just something um, that kind of enforces that. And um, my own experience has been, I work with field blends in uh, Antioch and Oakley, California, and, and Contra Costa. They're extremely interesting. But my, my own personal experience has been when I'm producing, if you will, a varietal wine, a Syrah, in every instance, there, will, I, there might be in this field three or four or five or six different clones of Syrah planted. And one clone is said to be superior because it has smaller clusters and the, the, the wine is darker or it has better acidity. But in every instance in my experience, the blend of the six different clones is always better than the individual clone. So taking that principle, and again, as long as the elements are all kind of coherent, I think that this um, diversity will, will just enrich the wine. Here's another way of thinking about it. The French make this, I think, really salient distinction between what they call wines of effort and wines of terroir. And a wine of effort is one that bears the strong stylistic imprint of the winemaker, where the winemaker is really trying to determine as much as he possibly can. And we do this in the new world. We do this very successfully in the new world. And it's, it's not a totally stupid thing to do. You, you want to know, it's like reading a book. You want to know how it comes out in the end. So you want to know what steps you can take to make the wine come out a certain way. You want it to taste consistent year after year. You want it to have a certain flavor profile that people like. And this makes a lot of sense. However, 
I would argue that it may make sense, but it ultimately makes a wine that's completely banal and beside the point. And essentially, everyone ends up making the same wine. What has happened lately in the last few years is there are certain influential critics who will remain nameless. That would be Robert Parker and, uh, and the Wine Spectator. And people now have tried, are trying to reverse engineer Parker's palette, and they're really successful at it. And uh, there's a company in Sonoma called Enologics that more or less can predict the Parker wine score while the, while the wine, before the wine is even finished fermenting, you know, within a great degree of accuracy. So, and they're basically, you know, they're just acting on their economic interest. If Parker gives it a 94, the wine can sell for this, this dollar amount. If he gives it a 91, it can sell for this dollar amount. So it's totally rational, except it's evil and bad. And, um, and more to the point, ultimately, maybe when good triumphs over evil, um, people will understand that wines made in this fashion have a certain hollowness to them, a certain simplicity to them. They're only as smart as us winemakers, and that's not very smart. A vin de terroir, on the other hand, really tries to, forgive the expression, leverage the complexity of nature, or expose the complexity of nature. And if you can, or reveal, if you can reveal the complexity of nature, it's a much vaster universe. It's a much vaster system, a, a more intelligent system than, than the intelligence of a, of a human being. And I think, therefore, Van de terroir are revelatory. There, there are depths to these wines that we cannot fashion through our own, through our artifice. Yeah, Grace. Um, you brought an innovation to the user experience of actually consuming wine, which anybody who's ever left behind corkscrew would really appreciate in really helping push through more use of screw caps in the earlier incarnation of one of you. Yes. Is there anything that you think that needs to be done to help the, the user experience, the consumer experience of a wine that will help consumers appreciate terroir and, and really get it? The question is, what can be done to, if you will, turn on the light, turn on the light bulb for terroir? I've thought about this for consumers. I've thought about this. It's really, it's complex. It's a complex question. It's a deceptively simple question. But I think there's kind of a quantum moment where you, ch where you literally flip from one universe into another universe. I don't know what it takes to trigger that moment. But again, it's a little bit like a gestalt because you're focusing on one element or several elements. For, for me, when I first started drinking wine, I liked wines that had oak because I thought oak correlates to quality, oak correlates to softness, oak correlates to smoothness. Therefore, good wine equals oak. And those were, that was one of the signifiers of quality. And there were a few other, you know, the texture, certain elements that, for me, signified quality. For Parker, it's raspberry juice, and, or raspberry jam, I should say. Things that are kind of soft and opulent, for him, equals quality. And at a certain point, something happens in your brain where you say, you know what, those are nice things, but maybe I'm looking at it the wrong way. Maybe these other aspects of the wine that I wasn't really noticing before, they shift and they sort of come into prominence and they become important. This minerality, this persistence, this chalkiness, this something about this wine, this is actually what's interesting about the wine, not the fruitiness, not the oakiness. This other element is what, is what is interesting. And then once you kind of can cue in on it, then you start looking for it, and that becomes consistently what you look for in wine. And then at that point, you can never drink a Napa Valley Cabernet ever again. So I, I don't know exactly what it takes. I think it's something like being in situ, you know, going to Italy, you know, it's like Italian wines. If you were to just pour an Italian wine, a Chianti for somebody, a, a California wine person, they would say, ooh, this wine is acidic, this wine is weird, where's the raspberry milkshake aspect that I come to trust and know? But if you're in Italy and you're 
you're eating a bowl of pasta and you know you're sitting outside and you're drinking this this Chianti, it's the most brilliant wine that you've ever consumed. So I think having a context really helps. Understanding where these wines come from, what the what what they're trying to achieve in these wines. Main, mainly, what do you eat it with? And what, you know, when do you eat it? And when do you drink it? So I think those are, those are the things that really set the stage for that aha. Yeah? Uh, for grape seeds, how, how can you tell the parents to, uh, to grape seeds like when the, the plants grow so from seed to uh, just how much like is parent is it? Really good question. Really good question. Depends on a lot of factors, mostly how old the, the selection is. For example, Carignan, which is a very old grape, it's been around, is genetically very stable, so the offspring look a lot like the parents. Cabernet Sauvignon, which is a relative youngin, um, the offspring don't look a lot like the parents. Now, here's the problem in a nutshell. Well, I won't be in a nutshell, in a, in a grape shell. Here's the problem. It would seem, on the face of it, that if you like Grenache, as I do, the, the, the straightforward thing to do would be to get some Grenache grapes and dissect out the seeds and, and germinate the seeds. The problem is plants are, vinifera plants are mostly, not all, but 99% of them are hermaphrodites. So they have male and female parts. And it's a little bit like what happens you know, in other species, when they interbreed, when a plant interbreeds with itself, there's a lot of genetic defects. It's like the Habsburgs with idiocy and hemophilia. So, with vines that are that are um, a lot of the a lot of the um, seeds are not viable, they're not productive, and they have a lot of they grow weakly. There's a lot of lot of problems. So, what you really want to do is actually hybridize them rather than than take the um, the grapes from the, from the from the seeds themselves, from the plants themselves. Did I did answer ask the question? I'm not sure I answered it. Oh, so how much variety will there be? So, yeah, the, the question is how much? What will the offspring look like relative to the parents? So it turns out, if you take the Grenache seeds from a Grenache vine, it'll be very Grenache-y, Grenache-ish. Certain varieties um, are, have more genetic variability. Pinot Noir, for example, if you take the seeds from Pinot Noir, they'll, they'll really look weird and different. Some will be pink, some will be white, some will be red, some will be polka dot. They won't be polka dot, but they'll be red, white, and pink. Um, but in most instances, they'll be less interesting than the parents. Now, if you hybridize them, that's, that's where you get really interesting vines. And the male part imparts certain characteristics and the female part imparts most uh, different characteristics. I'm told that with grape, when you hybridize grape vines, it's kind of like a bell curve. You get a, a whole bunch, 80% kind of look a lot alike. And then 10% on one side look are really weird and bad, and 10% on the other side are really weird and, and good. So, um, and different. So you're, you, you might, generally when you hybridize, when you're, when you're breeding grapes, you're looking for the 10% that are really interesting and, and, and positive. Um, but most of them are gonna look, are gonna look a lot alike. Yeah. Um, kind of similar question. Uh, if you're planning on, if you're growing from seed and not from a, a known rootstock, how do you plan for disease resistance? Correct. Or something like that? You pray, pretty much. <laughs> In other words, how do you how do you ensure against disease resistance? I. Well, first you start planting in virgin territory that has not had phylloxera before. That that's a good good place to start. Um, we, we can get, we cannot protect ourselves from phylloxera. If we grow grapes from seeds, they will eventually have phylloxera, most likely. But in Vineyard 2.0, the thought is grow them from, uh, grow rootstock, but grow the rootstock from seed. So one of the things I'm going to be doing this fall is going to Texas and collecting wild Vitus berlandieri and dissecting out those seeds and then rooting those seeds, and those are going to be the rootstock 
for the next iteration of um, what comes uh, what comes first. So that's how you protect yourself. Yes. Yeah, I'm just curious. Is there a general rule of thumb of when you should save a bottle as opposed to opening it? I know there's different varieties, obviously, but for like a wine amateur. Okay, if it comes from California, don't save it. <laughs> that would be my rule of thumb. Drink it in the parking lot would be the best advice I could give you. Um, yeah, California wines generally don't age very well. Um, it's a very complex. Some things that you would never imagine would age, age amazingly well. German Rieslings, sweet German Rieslings, for example, are the most brilliant wines to age. They, they'll last 20, 30 years. Oddly enough, in Burgundy, white Burgundies, which have a reputation for aging white, well, don't age very well anymore. It's kind of nobody knows why, but they, they don't. Um, the one rule of thumb is look at the alcohol. If the alcohol is really high, either don't buy it. My advice would be don't buy it. Or if you do buy it, drink it in the parking lot. Because ripe wines, they say the adage is the wine either ripens on the vine or it ripens in the cellar. So if, it, if you're starting with grapes that are too ripe, they will not have really great longevity. Wines that are 12 and a half, 13 percent, all things being equal, will live much longer than wines that are 15 percent. Yes? Um, so you started getting into the genetic part of the, in the questions, and, and I wonder why that didn't come up more in, in terms of matching the genetics to terroir, because you know, there, there are wines that do well in or grapes that do well in Germany, grapes that do well in Afghanistan, mm -hmm. you know, and, and so it seems like you could um, find part of that terroir match with Genetically suited toward the region. Well, you you could, and certainly I, I had a uh, two consultants, the uh, Claude and Lydia Bourguignon, who this is basically what they do, and they're terroir experts. And so, I mean, I, I put the question to them, you know, so like I've got this kind of volcanic soil over here and this kind of soil over here. What do you you know What do you think? Well, the problem is their their database their their knowledge base is limited. They know what grows in France. They know that Cabernet Sauvignon grows on gravelly soil, Merlot grows on clay soil, Pinot Noir grows on limestone soil. Uh, I had some chalky soil, and they said, uh, you know, uh, why don't you grow some of that, um, what's the grape from in, in Sherry, the uh, Palomino, you should grow some Palomino. It's like, Jesus, God, I, you know, I need Palomino like a hole in the head. You know, and so you can do these things, of course, and probably succeed, but again, you're, you're probably, your Palomino in, in San Juan Bautista on, on chalk soil is probably not going to be as interesting as the Palomino grown in Jerez, where they've had it, this opportunity to really fine tune it. So I think you go with your instinct, and you go with your instinct, and then you pay attention, and make mistakes, and, and maybe some of these things will work out really well and try to create a mechanism where you can actually iterate and learn from something and then adapt. We shall see. Yeah? Have you ever tried it, it, maybe it's too basic to just try a bunch of different grapes in the, for year one when you bought the property, just put a bunch in and see what happens? Well, the problem with that is that you can do that, and it's actually not, if you're, if I, if you're 25 or 30 years old, that is like a really good idea. The problem is you really don't know what you're going to get for at least seven or eight years, maybe 10 years. So you kind of have to go for it. You just have to kind of go for it, uh, you know, and not quit your day job, I think, is the... even longer from seeds, like how long it It does take longer to, to grow from seed. Um, the problem, of course, is that in some cases, the grape varieties that I want to propagate don't exist in California, so I have to, you know, clandestinely, oops, being recorded, I'm sorry, I have to um, <laughs> somehow obtain some of these un unusual grape varieties, propagate them, and then take the, collect the pollen and blah, 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 so it becomes a very complicated um, process. Um, anyways, we're marching forward somehow, we're marching forward. Kind of time almost. I, I don't know. Um, 
the wine tasting, if you wanted to quickly say something about the book or read something from the book. Okay, uh, uh, five minutes ish. It's five minutes. It's five ten. So people are showing up. I do. So um, I'm going to read you just a, a segment, a couple of paragraphs. <clears throat> so the book is the book is pretty goofy. It it um, there's a lot of literary parody and poems and songs and essays. But um, when I first started doing these parodies, I thought I just need to parody classical literature. So I did Kafka and and Joyce and uh, Shakespeare and this and Cervantes, and then um, I realized I could I could parody popular literature as well. So I did J D Salinger, and then I sort of took the plunge and I did um, Philip Roth with uh, Portnoy's Complaint, and this is this is called Trotnoy's Complaint. It's very 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 naughty. So I won't read you the raciest bits, but I'll, I'll read you a, a little bit. <clears throat> So the, the, the character is called Al, uh, Alexander Trotnoy. I lived at home with my parents well into my young adulthood, doctor. It gives me no great pride to admit. They were a constant source of anxiety and shame to me, in no small part, due to their incomprehension of the elegant nuances and possi extraordinary possibilities of fine wine. For them, the acme of enological excellence began and ended with Manischewitz elderberry, kosher le Pesach. They were preternaturally frugal and refused to ever throw anything away, always decanting the unconsumed glasses back into the bottle at the end of the yearly Seder, which was the only occasion that wine was ever to be seen at our table when I was growing up. I'm quite sure there was but a single bottle of Manischewitz elderberry produced during the Johnson administration that lasted us at least until the ouster of Tricky Dick. In recalling it now, I know it was an old bottle because its familiar clunky square shape did not have a government warning label on it, though it was possible that the warning had fallen off due to exposure to toxic levels of mutant microbial life forms germinating in the science experiment that was my mother's refrigerator. My parents, who were quite moderate in their consumption, considered it extremely bad form not to at least take a taste of wine when the brucha, or ritual blessing over the wine, was said. I remember one Seder when it was absolutely impossible for me to consider tasting this impossibly disgusting liquid semi-life form that had been decanted and recanted an endless number of times. Just a taste, Alex, it wouldn't kill you, my mother says to me. No, mother, I beg to differ. It would kill me. In fact, it will kill all of us. The CDC in Atlanta will be very interested to know why the entire Trotnoy family of Newark, New Jersey was sickened unto death by uncontrollable hemorrhagic bleeding from all of their orifices, as well as from the formation of gangrenously separating green pus would you look at the mouth on him, she asks my father. He's such an expert wine taster. <laughs> I don't know what kind of palate you have, Mr. Big Shot, Mr. Wine Snob, but you've got quite a mouth on you. I'll tell you that, Alex. Are you or are you not going to say a brucha and taste the wine? Please, mother, I'd rather not. Are you saying that you're too good, too refined, too la-di-da for Manischewitz? Uh, yes, mother, I am. <laughs> As your mother, I command you to taste the wine. This would be utterly comical, except for the fact that my mother, and I'm not kidding, doctor, my mother had taken the corkscrew onto her, into her hand and was holding the business end of it poised to my throat. <laughs> Just take one little sippy for your mother, Alex. My mother was going to stab me with a corkscrew if I did not take at least a little sippy of Manischewitz. There you have it.